So someone put in live after talking about second opinions, should we consider getting second opinions? So I don't know if either of you, who wants to tackle this one first? Yeah, I can offer a perspective. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm a strong believer that second opinions uh, are very useful and informative. I think it goes along with the theme that in diseases like cutaneous lymphomas, which are uncommon, advocating for oneself is so key. You know, this is something that often goes unrecognized for a long time. And even when recognized, because they are rare diseases, they can be very hard to understand what the perfect or correct treatment is in any given situation. If you meet uh, your healthcare providers and believe that their plan of care makes sense and you agree with it, then that's the most important thing. And you could comfortably proceed with that plan of care. But if there's any part of you that says, either I want to hear another thought process or I would just like to get more information, um, I think you should advocate for yourself and not be shy about requesting that second opinion. And I would hope that any provider that you meet that um, you raise this question about would be uh, willing to entertain that and actually encourage it because it's not about um, following the directions of a specific person. Um, it's about understanding what's best for the patient, no matter who they get that information from and how many opinions it takes. When doing a PET scan for CTCL MF, first time diagnosis, what is the doctor looking for? I can start with that one. Um, so it's a great question. It's because we often think about cutaneous lymphomas as being skin related diseases, and, and that's true. That's the focal point of how we evaluate people. Um, but we also know that, though uncommon, depending on the extent or the characteristics of the cutaneous lymphoma, the lymphoma can sometimes involve areas outside the skin. And the main compartments we think about are internally, so commonly lymph nodes of the body or internal organs. And the other compartment we think about is the blood. And so for the blood, we can obviously look into this via blood work and blood tests, but a scan, whether a CT scan or a PET CT scan is an effective way to understand whether there are any um, concerning appearing lymph nodes or areas of organs that we can see that might raise concern for additional testing or even biopsies that could be uh, performed and considered if it's thought that the lymphoma is involving those areas. This, the decision to do a scan is also individualized because we understand that for people with lesser amounts of disease or, or thin plaques or patches, sometimes the chances of finding something internally are so low that we may be able to defer that study. Um, but the decision is ultimately a shared one between you as the patient and your doctor team. So have a conversation about that with them. Okay, thank you. What is a good CD4 to CD8 ratio? So this is a relatively broad question. What I'd say is CD4 and CD8 refer to, I believe in this context, the different types of immune cells you have, specifically T cells. And because we know that lymphomas arise, in this case, cutaneous T cell lymphomas, arise from T cells, sometimes we can learn about the characteristics or the presence of lymphoma if we see an abnormal balance between the number of CD4 and CD8 T cells in the body. Um, we have a normal proportion, and when that's thrown out of balance, that can suggest there's something going on. But again, it really depends on, as Dr. Goyle mentioned in response to another question earlier on, where are we looking? Is it in a biopsy? Are we looking at the tissue of the skin for presence of lymphoma? Are we looking at the blood to see if they're abnormal? excesses of one type of T cell in the blood. Um, so more context is important here, but when you see CD4 and CD8 in the context of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, that should be a trigger that your doctors and your team are trying to ask a question, probably something related to the presence or signs of lymphoma in whatever compartment that they're examining. Does recurrent folliculitis in a patient of MS also suggest a possibility of follicular MF? It is possible, but it is also true that um, MF patients can get more frequent bacterial infections like folliculitis. So sometimes you can't really tell clinically whether it's folliculitis or follicular MF. Uh, you can get follicular MF that looks exactly like folliculitis. So generally when I have a patient like that in my office, I like to do a bacterial culture of one of the pustules if you have a pus bump. Uh, and then uh, to rule out bacterial folliculitis. And then uh, sometimes we also just empirically treat with topicals to treat the bacterial folliculitis 
uh, to, and if it goes away, then, then you kind of have your answer. Um, but a biopsy can also be very helpful. So if it's not getting better with simple things, a skin biopsy should show whether it's follicular MF. Is flow cytometry a good enough test to rule out peripheral blood involvement? Well, the problem is lymphomas come from blood cells. Lymphocytes are blood cells. So in theory, even someone with very early stage disease may have a rogue cell that takes a turn through the blood, not that they stay there. So the concept of blood involvement has to do with the amount of cells and whether there's enough there to merit treating the blood specifically. And I would say, if that's the question, is there enough blood involvement that a treatment should be designed to treat that area? And flow cytometry is an excellent test. Okay. I'll add Thank my you. two cents about, uh, about flow cytometry. Uh, I think uh, one thing to know is that you can have uh, you can have benign extensive skin rashes sometimes have a false positive low level flow cytometry. So it is not a 100% specific test. Just keep that in mind. Um, there's also ancillary testing like T cell receptor gene arrangement studies can be done in skin and blood that help you interpret the results of the flow. So what I usually tell my patients is the flow is a valuable test in the right setting, but has to also be interpreted with the other um, molecular tests, um, sometimes when it's, it's a borderline result. What does a biopsy showing large cell transformation indicate? So um, generally, if, if um, we're seeing large cell transformation, um, you know, it indicates that there um, are a greater number of cells that um, are kind of expressing more CD30. Um, it may be an indication that, um, you know, we, we might want to, um, you know, if somebody is, is kind of just on skin uh, directed treatments alone, um, sometimes we'd like to include some systemic treatments in there as well. Um, to kind of um, help help target it a little bit more. Um, it can indicate that the lymphoma may be growing a little bit um, more than it was previously growing. Our next question, is a buffy coat smear, sensory preparation, better than flow cytometry in picking up tumor cells in the blood? I think this referenced the earlier question. So I think that, again, that's going back to how I answered it earlier, um, that I think mostly what we try to rely on at this point is flow cytometry. Um, if someone's looking at a smear and they see kind of irregular cells, obviously that's of some concern. Uh, in our staging itself, in terms, of, in terms of blood involvement, we have a number of different quantified um, areas in terms of B0, B1, and B2. And from the point of view of it all depends on at your own institution, what's available. Um, I don't, I don't know of particular data, um, uh, looking at, um, kind of the two of them, uh, head to head. Um, I don't know. Do you, Zach? No, I don't. So I don't know that there's necessarily one over the other. Most of our guidelines have a little bit of both uh, because we want to ensure that not only in this country, but in other countries, if your resources are, uh, are only the Buffy coat, then, um, you know, then able to uh, be, be able to stage people appropriately. How many positive biopsy results are required to confirm a diagnosis of MF? We always have biopsy questions. <laughs> um, Dr. Fulner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the biopsy uh, findings are very, we say, nonspecific, meaning if you showed me this biopsy and told me it was, and especially in early stage disease, and told me it was eczema, I believe you. If you told me this was early stage mycosis fungoides, I would believe you. Um, so it really depends upon a, a lot of different factors, what the clinical history is, what the clinical presentation is, or how things look. Um, I'm, I'm guessing positive might refer to maybe something called the T cell gene rearrangement. Um, so this is if they're looking for if there are clonal T cells in the biopsy specimen. Um, 
uh, that doesn't necessarily put the nail, you know, not I'm going to say that, but it doesn't necessarily nail the diagnosis because you can still see clonal T cells in benign things like eczema. Um, so I would say having multiple biopsies showing features with consistent with mycosis mucos fungoides as well as the clinical picture um, would all kind of support and favor it. We, re we really rarely have things that just kind of say, this is what it is, unfortunately. Um, and it requires kind of a coordination with the whole team. Um, if things are very advanced and later stage mycosis fungoides, it kind of usually becomes pretty clear. Uh, but I would say if there's a little bit of uncertainty about what's going on, that also maybe can be seen as a good thing. Uh, it could also still be an inflammatory thing and it's not clearly presenting itself. Is the incidence of cutaneous lymphoma increasing or is early diagnosis just getting better? Dr. Girardi? It's always hard to separate this. This is a question that's come up with in multiple settings, including cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and for example, melanoma. Um, of course, our big goal is to have patients become more aware and for um, doctors to have um, be fully educated about the possibility of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. I think that um, for uh, early disease, I still see so many misdiagnoses, delayed diagnoses, um, I, you know, and then advanced disease. It might be a little more obvious that something is wrong, but the having the expertise on correct subtype and uh, an appropriate workup comes into play. The short answer to the question is, I don't have a, a clarity on incidents versus uh, on early detection um, that, that would be a bias on that. I would say I've been at Yale for uh, over 25 years and um, you know I've seen more and more cases over those years. And, and so it, it does give me pause to worry a little bit more about the incidents, um, but I don't have a solid answer for you on that. You know, in the first few years of being diagnosed and understanding how the disease is progressing and, and working in an individual, particularly for the behavior of early stage mycosis fungoides and how much does delayed diagnosis have an impact on potential progression um, or, you know, how does someone's disease move potentially from early stage to um, maybe a more challenging disease? Right. I've always felt, and one reason I'm so passionate about caring for patients with cutaneous lymphoma is that it's so hard to answer a lot of these questions, even though they're such important questions, which is what does the future hold? If I'm diagnosed with a certain stage or type of mycosis fungoides, what are the chances it will change? Um, what are the chances it'll stay stable? And through years of research, of course, in the literature, we can sometimes gain broad strokes of understanding and themes that we can counsel patients with, such as for many patients with early stage or limited stage disease, many will stay that course and have thankfully relatively manageable symptoms um, across time um, looking towards the future. But we also know that uh, a proportion of patients will have more significant symptoms or progression from earlier to more involved stages of mycosis fungoides, whether that's thicker skin lesions like tumors or blood involvement. Um, so I think the care is very individualized obviously a close working relationship between you as the patient and your physician team is so critical because even though none of us can predict the future, I think one of the most important things we can do is with every time point of follow-up, give you clear, honest information about whether there are any red flags that we're seeing, whether we're overall reassured. And that way we can have kind of dynamic updates in the status um, of a patient condition that hopefully keeps both parties really well apprised of where we're at and everyone most informed. That's great. That's great. Dr. Liu, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I would absolutely echo Dr. Moe's uh, sentiments. Um, and, and just add the interesting thing, particularly with, with PTCL and MF in particular, as I think many in the audience probably are aware, is is really it is a, a challenge of diagnosis, and uh, there's understandably a bit of anxiety about well, you know, the had caught it earlier and, and, and such, which is very understandable. 
Um, the challenge, of course, is because it can look like a lot of these common neurologic conditions that we see, things like eczema and psoriasis and fungal infections, which um, are very common types of strips that uh, patients have been through before we, we get to see them. Um, the, the, one, um, the one good thing is, is that the nature of the disease, especially on these early stages, is, is fortunately many patients have, have excellent prognosis. And um, while in an ideal world, we would uh, capture everything um, you know, as soon as it appears and, and give a name to it and we're definitive, the reality is that um, from a progression standpoint, there probably is little, little adverse impact on overall survival and such. Um, the final issue, though, of course, is quality of life issues and just to make sure that we're using the best tools for the job. And that's where um, early diagnosis, that's why we continue our efforts to refine that both clinically and over the medical school. Is there any data out there that uh, gives any uh, light into why CTCL is more common in African Americans? I actually want to study that. <laughs> so, um, there we go. Okay, yeah. there we go. maybe we should connect. So, um, as far as I know, like, uh, there are epidemiology study to learn that African American develop a disease at early stage, like at early age and more advanced stage. And um, uh, my experience, I do have very young African American patients with very aggressive cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Um, but in terms of, I try to look into everything I could, try to understand uh, why, if there's anything in terms of the disease biology, do they have different mutations? Is it the in, like immune environment that's different? I don't think there are great data in there. Uh, sometimes people think is that the, melano, the melanocytes kind of protects the skin from the sun. And then we know that sun helps with the uh, cutaneous T cell lymphoma. That might be why. But I think um, the answer is probably going to be very complicated. And until we look at the um, immune environment together with the genetic marker of the tumor, um, we would not be able to understand why. And you know, the key is to understand the underlying biology difference and maybe the treatment approach should be kind of tailored to whatever it's underlying in terms of genetic mutations and immune environment. Yeah, but that's some, something I definitely, you know, will <laughs> love to have someone that ad, like advocate for like research project like this, so. <laughs> So if a patient has one, one out of three TCR results come back positive, is it worth consult, continuing to TCR test further biopsies? And I imagine this is referring to skin biopsies, um, but that's also a, you know, an interesting question and one I think where a little bit more clinical context would be needed. Um, in our experience, I think the TCR testing has been helpful for making a more definitive diagnosis. Um, TCR testing, of course, does have its own limitations. Um, just because you have a positive result doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, cutaneous lymphoma. Um, and the converse is true, too, where just because you have a negative result, um, it doesn't mean that lymphoma is ruled out. Um, so I think uh, looking at the specifics of the TCR results, um, is it the same TCR uh, sequence that was detected in different biopsies? Um, and over time, to having more evidence of multiple samples kind of showing the same results, I think that would get us a little bit closer to a diagnosis of MF or other CTCL. Um, but um, a little bit of a challenging question to answer without knowing additional information. 